I get to start off a brand new sermon series today over the course of the next three weeks into Christmas Eve on the oh-so-relevant topic, tis the season of, you know, drum roll please, Christmas. We're going to talk about Christmas the next three weeks. And from my perspective and from Northeast perspective, Christmas is really about one thing. Any guesses? That would be, yeah, Jesus. Jesus, Christmas is not about Santa, okay? It's not about presents. Although I love Santa, he's visiting the house this year. He's going to bring some presents. Christmas is not about the food, although I love Christmas food. That's why I, I work out, to offset Christmas. I'm just saying, and I love the Christmas food. Christmas is not about peppermint mocha, uh, okay, and I don't really like that. Christmas is not about the Hallmark Channel. God help us, men. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you. Thank you, all right? We'll go, we'll go to counseling together. Uh, Okay, Christmas is not about the Starbucks cups either. Christians, you might need to hear this today. Who cares? I don't know what's on the cup this year, and I really don't care what's on this cup this year. Because Christmas, for me, is about one thing, one singular thing, and it's the same thing that every other day is about for me. And that is Jesus. Now, here's the interesting thing, though, about Christmas in our culture. It's become largely a secular holiday, right? Happy holidays, people say. And uh, a lot of folks get really, really fired up over that inside the church. Now, in my humble opinion, I don't think we should get fired up over it for, for two reasons. One, why is it all that surprising to you that people who don't worship Jesus decide in December not to worship Jesus <laughs> like they do in January through November? Would it be fair if a Jewish person got mad at you for not celebrating Hanukkah? Would it be fair for a Muslim person to get mad at you for not celebrating Ramadan? All right, you see what I'm saying, right? So this whole idea of, of coercing people into Christmas, okay, let me ask you. Did, you. did Jesus coerce you into a relationship with him? Or did he offer an invitation of love to you and let you decide on your own? Yeah, because you see, exactly. Okay, he's gifted us with the gift of love, but also with the gift of free will. And we should gift our friends and the people of our culture with the very same gift. So don't be a butthead this Christmas, all right? Being a butthead to them does not reflect well on him. And yes, that rhymed on purpose. Now, the second thing I would say, and the second reason why we shouldn't really get all fired up over, you know, happy holidays or whatever, is, um, well, it's, it's because I don't think Christmas is a stolen holiday at all. In fact, I think if you look hard and close enough at the most popular and prominent pillars of our culture's celebration, what you'll find is opportunity, like no other season throughout the year, to shine the light of Jesus and to tell the story of Jesus. I mean, look at the most popular pillars of our culture's celebration. And tell me these don't point back to. Tell me these don't originate in Jesus. In our culture, Christian or not, December's a season of giving, right? People get super generous. They give stuff to friends and family, spend way more money than, than you have. People are more generous in December than any other month of the year. Why? Why? Could it be that on the first Christmas, God so loved the world that he gave. Christmas is a, a time for friendly and family gatherings. People will travel all around the world. You got seven Christmas parties. You'll, you'll spend more time in the car than you actually will with your family just to spend a little bit of time with your family during Christmas. You don't even like your family. <laughs> you'll travel across the country to, to, to be with them, like that group of crazies, also known as your in-laws. And I mean, and it's, it's just crazy. You don't even like being there. Okay, the only part you, you like about it is that it just gets crazy, and it's like good entertainment. It's a reality TV show once the eggnog starts getting pestered around. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, okay, I'll tell you how to set it off this year. All right, make sure your grandpa and your millennial nephew's in the same room, and then just say one word, Trump. And then just <laughs> watch it. It's like it's going to go, go crazy, right? It'll go crazy. Now, now why do we endure such crazy Every Christmas. Why? Why do we endure it? Okay. Could it be, could it be, that 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and proclaimed peace on earth and goodwill to all people? And so we try to practice that during the season. Uh, December is also a festival of lights. There's light up LaGrange last night. People go to light shows. You hang lights all over your house. I mean, some of you go Clark Griswold on the thing, and I, you know, more power to you. W women, women love like these you know, the scented candles this time of year. They light them in the house. At balsam and, and cedar is what's, in our, is what's in our house. Men just like lighting them. You know? That's not a Christmas thing. We just like lighting stuff in general. But, but you, okay, we celebrate Christmas with lights. Why? Could it be that because on the first Christmas... Jesus proclaimed the coming of the light of the world. Don't you see? Don't you see? 
in my humble opinion, we don't need to put Christ back into Christmas. He's already there. What we need, Christians, is we need to magnify Christ this Christmas in the radical ways he did on the first Christmas. We need to take this season of opportunity and capitalize on it like no other season throughout the year. Now, that's what the next three weeks are about. We're just going to talk about these prominent popular pillars in our culture celebration, all right, giving, family gatherings, and, and, and like this, this festival of lights that we experience. And we're just going to talk about how to pull the radical calling of Jesus out of it. And I don't want you to miss it. Today, we're going to talk about your most favorite topic of them all, all right? We're going to talk about giving and generosity. And uh, I'll just go ahead and tell you from the front so you don't think I'm one of those slimy preachers, uh, no bait and switch. At the end of the message, I'm going to make a giving ask of our Northeast folks. Now, it's the coolest thing we do all year, so don't, don't, don't get nervous. I think you'll want, if you're a Northeast person, I think you'll want to give to this. But if you're a first-timer here or you're kind of new to our church, I want to just say a few things to you, all right? Because, like, I always feel for people who show up for the first time on a giving weekend, they're like, oh, it's a mega church and it's a giving weekend. Surprise, surprise, honey, hold on to your purse, right? Like, here's the deal. We, uh, one, we don't talk about giving every weekend. All right, we do a few times a year, but we don't every weekend. So come back next weekend and give us another chance. I'm just saying. Um, now, two, when we get to the end and I make the ask, I just want you to know, first timer, non Northeast person, you're still deciding on us. We're dating, okay? I just want you to know, feel no obligation to give. You are officially pardoned from giving, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Okay, you're pardoned. You are pardoned. Now, I will say you need to listen though. Pay attention to what we say. Uh, to pay attention to some of the things I talk about because what you'll find out during that ask, is what's at the heart of this church. See, Jesus said where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And what you'll find out by the end of the day is where a lot of our treasure as a church flows toward. And hopefully, I think it will excite you and perhaps even attract you to want to be a part of this family. Now, uh, with that said, uh, let me start today with uh, our congregational reading. Uh, We're going to read together a passage from the second letter of Corinthians. It's not even a Christmas passage. Uh, It's a passage on on generosity. Um, But the reason why I chose it during this Christmas season is because I think the last scripture, the last verse from this passage, actually points to the Christmas message better than any other verse in all the scriptures. So I'll read the parts in white. You read the parts that are highlighted, and we'll just kind of go back and forth and work our way through this. Powerful passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, the apostle Paul writes to his brothers and sisters in Corinth. He says, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God and his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. They did it out of their own free will. In fact, they begged us. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. So we've urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I'm not commanding you to do this. I'm testing how genuine, uh, genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. I love that last verse. That's, that's the message of Christmas. Let me read it to you again. Because this is what incarnation means. It's what it looks like. Though Jesus was rich, endlessly and eternally rich, yet for your sake and for my sake, he became dangerously and desperately poor. So that by his poverty, he could make us rich. Now, you know one thing that that often gets missed in a passage like this? Uh, What often gets missed is the fact that Paul said Jesus is rich. 
He's rich, y'all. Hey, that's good news for all the rich people in the room because that means being rich isn't bad. You know what makes riches good or bad? Not having them, but how you use them, right? And here's the crazy thing. While Jesus was rich, he, chose, he shows us exactly how to use our riches, right? It says, though he was rich, he became poor so that we might become rich. He was insanely generous. Now, um, this week, you, you know what I did? I took this passage, 2 Corinthians 8 9. And I just use it as a filter, a lens through which to read the Christmas story. I opened my Bible to Luke 1 and 2, Matthew 1 and 2, John 1, 1 through 18. And I just read all the passages about the coming of Jesus. First Christmas, incarnation, Emmanuel. And, and I just said, God, you know, show me. Take me deeper into the loving sacrifice Jesus made by leaving heaven, becoming a man on earth for us. And then I just wrote down all the ideas and insights that came to my mind. I just want to share them with you. The list got pretty long, but I think it's important because I want you to see this passage, this powerful passage in Christmas. See, on the first Christmas, the God of Abraham became the son of Abraham. The word who was transformed into the word who became Spiritual to material, that's the move he made. Transcendent to transcendent. Cosmic to microscopic. Jesus was larger than life, but then he became a human zygote. From a throne room to a teenage womb. The author of truth willingly became the subject of gossip. He moved from majesty to manger. Beaming to, begot to begotten. I want you to think about this. He birthed Mary, <laughs> but then he allowed himself to be birthed by Mary. He was the protector of Mary, and then he found himself pr suddenly protected by Mary. From magnificent to magnificat, beyond to Bethlehem, angelic choir to silent night, immeasurable to Emmanuel, creator to created. He gave up streets of gold for a bed of straw, crowned to crying. The fearful, wonderful maker was fearfully and wonderfully made. From ruler to ruled. From the object of temple sacrifice to offering, temple sacrifice, angels to shepherds. The giver of all gifts became the recipient of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. From holy of holies to hunted by Herod, running heaven to on the run to Egypt, immortal to mortal, dominion to dependent, venerable to vulnerable, the lion to lamb, priest to sacrifice. He gave up the pleasures of heaven for the pains of earth. He lived apart from sin, but then immersed himself into our sin. The Lord became savior. The served became servant. The hero of heaven became the hero of humanity, promise maker to promise keeper. Jesus was endlessly rich, but he became dangerously poor. And why? For me, for me and for you. Now, this is what love looks like, y'all. This, this. Love's not a feeling. It's not chemistry. It's not something that you fall into. No, love is measured by one thing and one thing alone, and that's sacrifice, what you're willing to do in love for someone else. And he was willing to do it all. Okay, I don't want to water down the message of Christmas today. Okay, I don't want to understate what Jesus did for us. So let me just give it to you in all of its offensiveness, in all of its radicalness. Okay, and I'm not saying this from a place of personal holiness. Understand, I'm speaking this from a place of personal brokenness. I'm the biggest hypocrite in the room. I got a long way to go in following Jesus into his radical generosity. But you need to understand, the message of the first Christmas is not that Jesus, well, he just kind of gave us some. Okay, Jesus didn't settle for a tithe on the first Christmas. Jesus didn't just adopt us into his family for a couple days, you know, put a couple of gifts under our tree, make sure we had a warm meal. Jesus didn't grab just a couple of used coats out of his closet so that we'll be warm for a few weeks. Jesus didn't just serve at the soup kitchen for a few hours. Okay, and while all that is good and all that is worthy of your time, while all that is a beautiful micro step towards Jesus, that does not encapsulate in summation and totality what Jesus did for us. No, you need to understand, on the first Christmas, Jesus didn't offer us a donation. He offered us a substitution. He drained his bank account and transferred it to ours. He absorbed our poverty and then imputed into us his riches and his righteousness. And that's what love looks like. And my friends, that's what it looks like to be rich, at least on God's terms. Now, we, we need to wrap our minds around that today. America! Okay. 
Those who won the birth lottery and ended up in the wealthiest country in the history of the planet Earth, America, we need to wrap our minds around what Jesus did on that first Christmas because we're rich. And we need a, we need a desire to be rich like him. Okay, okay you're rich. Just, can we just talk about this for a second? All right. Okay, we've got people from all sorts of different socioeconomic classes. I know some of you are like looking over your shoulders like he's talking to me, but yes, I'm talking to you. Do you okay, let me show you a few things. Okay? I just don't know if you ever thought about this before, but check this out. Did you know that a third of the world, that's two to three billion people, um, lives on $2 or less a day? Did you know that if you make over $32,000 a year or more, you are in the top 1% of wage earners on the planet Earth? Look at you go. Did you know that if you make over $17,000 a year or more, you're in the top 5% of wage earners on the planet Earth? So look, again, I know you don't, you don't feel rich, but ladies and gentlemen, you won the birth lottery. You live in this country and... You're kind, of, you're kind of rich. Okay, you didn't know what you were going to learn coming to church today. Congratulations. Give your husband a high five. You learned that you're rich. <laughs> now, the reason why nobody's high-fiving, clapping, or dancing in the aisles right now is because while we're rich compared to global standards, none of us feel that way. And the reason why you don't feel that way is because you have no margin, which is not an income problem as much as a spending problem, but that's another sermon. I, I want you to imagine for a second. Uh, that you had to get on a, a plane and travel to some like third world environment where people are, are living off less than $2 a day. And you had to explain to them the financial pressures you're under in America. Wouldn't it sound just crazy to them? Hey, look, listen, I know it's tough here in the village, but you know, Starbucks isn't getting any cheaper. You know how much their breakfast sandwiches are? But, and a th- a third of my paycheck now has to go to the, the mortgage every month. And I got two car payments, three kids in private schools. You know, the heating bill's up in December. To which they might look back at you and say, wait, you have indoor heat? Okay, don't you see? Like, it would just sound, it would sound crazy to them, right? It would sound crazy. And you know why it would sound crazy? It's because we're crazy. Okay, so let me prove it to you. Uh, researchers who uh, have uh, like been watching how uh, you know, Americans in this very, very wealthy country that we live in uh, act and operate have found uh, two things to be true of us in the midst of our wealth. And they're so counterintuitive. They're so crazy. But I just want you to know, um, did you know that the more money people have, this is, this is stats, y'all. This is not me just making it up. Did you know the statistics have shown that the more money people have, the more people tend to worry and stress about money? Which, again, is so crazy. It's so counterintuitive because you would think that if you get more, it would be this safety blanket, right? That's why you want more, so that you don't have to stress about money. But time and time again, the research has has proven that when you get more money, you just tend to focus on it. It tends to absorb your mind and absorb your thoughts and absorb your energy and time more than if you had less. Did you also know that the more money people have, the less percentage of their money they tend to give? Isn't that crazier? The richer people get, they may give a a, a larger dollar amount, but the percentage actually goes down. Isn't that strange? Isn't that kind of crazy? Now, I have a theory as to why this is the truth. Okay, I've got a theory. You want my theory? Okay, of course you don't, but you're going to get it. I got the mic. Here's my theory. Uh, My theory is that uh, the reason why we're in in all this trouble is because we allow our standard of living to keep pace with our financial earnings. That's what we do. We almost believe that it's our right, right? Which, if you're not a Jesus follower, it is your right. You're the Lord over your money. You can do whatever you want to. But if you are a Jesus follower, you can't get baptized with your wallet out the water, right? I'm just saying. Like, so, <laughs> you got to ask yourself, is this the right way to go? Now, okay, you know, you know how crazy some of us are? Some of us are so crazy that we don't just allow our standard of living to pace with our financial earnings. We allow our standard of living to outpace our financial earnings. Man, you're good. We're crazy, one or the other. Okay, you know how you do this. You do this through this, um, this 20th century innovation called consumer credit. You heard of these things before? Credit cards? So what you can do is you can take a piece of plastic with your name on it. And you can just like swipe, 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 swipe it. And you can actually, it's crazy, I know. You can take possession of stuff in the present that you can't actually afford. Okay, here's what you can do. You, basically, you can get in a time machine. And you can travel up to like January, February, even March, if you're really good or bad at this, depending on your perspective. And you can grab your paycheck from January, February, March, drag it into December, and spend it now, even though you haven't earned it yet. 
Isn't that, cra- isn't that cool? It's cool for the December version of you, right? Not so cool for the March version of you, though. And if the March version of you were here in December, they'd kick your rear end up and down the wall of the rooms, okay? I'm just saying. But they're not here. So swipe, swipe, swipe. Well, this is what we do. And it's just crazy. It's crazy. So let me ask you guys just two questions. I just want you to consider them, all right? Would you just consider these questions? Just consider them. Again, personal brokenness, not self-righteousness. I'm just saying. But would you consider this? Question one. Do you think it's possible for someone to keep their standard of living 10% behind their financial earnings and then live to tell about it. Is it, is it even possible? Okay, let me, let me be more practical. Do you think it's possible for, let's say, a family of four who earns collectively as a household $100,000 to live off of $90,000 and survive? Do you know any families that have done this? Okay, you guys aren't laughing, so that's fine. We'll go to the next question. Um, I want you to consider this. I just want you to think about it. Have you ever stopped and put a dollar sign on enough? Have you ever stopped and done that? Because, you see, the reason why we continue to want more and more and more is because we feel like we don't have enough. And I get that, right? I get that. Everybody aspires to a just certain level of security and safety in their life. So I get that. But, but have you ever stopped and just thought about, you know, when I get this much in the, in the bank, that's enough. When I get this much in the savings, that's enough. When I reach this pay bracket, from that point forward, anything I get on top of that, well, that's, that should just be God's. Because that's more than enough for us, right? And he's blessed us with, with so much. Have you ever done that? An honest moment of self-disclosure here, I have not. And I probably should but I haven't. In fact, I would bet that even though we're rich, few of us have ever done that because we're not good at being rich. And that's the difference between us and Jesus. He was rich. We're rich. But he's actually good at it. So can I make a challenge to everyone in this room, Christian or not? Can I just make a challenge to you today? This Christmas, I challenge you to be better at being rich. Just be more generous. And trust me, There's joy in generosity. Now, for those of you who are part of Northeast, though, I love you so much that I don't just want to challenge you today. I love you so much, I'm going to give you an opportunity. (laughs) See what I did there? I want to give you an opportunity to be better at being rich. Now, for those of you who are new here or, like, not a part of the family, this is the part where, like, you are pardoned from participating in, okay? Just, like, okay, don't get on Twitter. Listen, because I think you're going to get to hear the heart of our church, but you are pardoned from this. But Northeast people... All right, um, I'm your pastor, right? So we got a love-love relationship. Except on weekends, I talk about money. But other, every other weekend, we got a love-love relationship. So uh, you know what I did this weekend I, is I made a Christmas list, my Christmas wish list for you. All right, some of you want to get me a gift for Christmas. I thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to show you my wish list. Here's the deal. I don't want anything else except what's on this wish list. All right, so don't send me, a, you know, a gift card. Um, don't, okay, don't, do not go to Lifeway and waste your, don't go to, just don't go to Lifeway. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to give me a gift this year, here's, here's what I want, okay? For Christmas this year, I want 100% of our Northeast people to give an above and beyond sacrificial gift to our Love the Ville Youth Fund. That's it. I, look, I don't want a lot for Christmas. But there's just one thing that I need. I don't care about the presents. Okay, so a few of you get it. Okay, did you get it? Anyways, this is what I want. Okay, now this is kind of a mouthful. Let me break this down for you real quick, all right? Let's start with uh, Love the Ville Eve Fund there uh, at, at the end. For those of you who don't know, three years ago, our church set out to become the Love the Ville Church. Basically, three years ago, we decided that we were going to start a movement that revolved around two core values, servanthood and generosity. We wanted to redefine church in our city. You see, when people think of the word church, especially those outside the church, they think of something, and it's usually not good. We wanted it to be the love of Jesus Christ. So we just said, look, we're going to redefine church around the love of Jesus. We're going to earn for ourselves a reputation in this city as the Love the Ville Church three years ago. Now, three years later, how are we doing? Well, um, I think we're doing pretty well. Uh, let me give you one small example of this. A couple weeks ago, uh, a prominent Christian leader uh, called me up. And he asked me next summer to speak at one of the largest Christian conferences in North America every year. There will be over a thousand churches represented there, hundreds of missionaries, hundreds of parachurch organizations. When he called me and asked, I was flattered, really. 
and I kind of, <laughs> I kind of just like started to laugh out loud. And I asked him the same question you're probably wondering right now. What in the world do you want me to come and talk about? <laughs> right? Because I'm just Tyler, okay? Like I'm, thir- what, 30, I'm an 86, 31 years old, all right? I'm a millennial. Millennials are idiots. What, is, what would you want me to come and talk about? And you know what he said? Love the Ville. He said, I, I've never seen a church change their culture as quickly as Northeast has. And I believe there should be a Love the Ville movement in every city and every church in our country. So come tell the Northeast story and maybe we can inspire a few more. Now, yeah. When he, when he said that, I was just like, wow. Like, what, you know what that proves to me? It proves to me that we're earning for ourselves a reputation as a Loveville church. We're doing it, y'all. We've put faith into action, and God's just honoring that. And, you know, it's not about us, but isn't it neat to be able to inspire others? The other Christians and Christian leaders and, and churches are beginning to acknowledge this. Our mayor and governor have commended us for it. Most recently, we got the Governor's Distingu- uh, Distinguished Servant Award. Okay, and more importantly than that, the people of our city are beginning to trust us and come to know us for nothing more than simply the love of Jesus. And this thing's only three years old. I mean, come on, we're just a cute little baby at this point. Imagine what kind of terror we will be when we're teenagers. <laughs> now, check us out. Here's what you need to know about Love the Ville. Every year, our Love the Ville ministries and partnerships are funded out of our Christmas Eve offering. That's what we do. 2015, we collected a quarter million. It funded 2016, Love the Ville. Last year, we set a record, collected around 300,000. It funded 2017, Love the Ville. So this year, tis the season, right? Tis the season for giving. And I just want to tell you that our staff, we don't operate within the comfort zone. We don't operate with status quo in mind. So this year, we've planned to double our impact in Love the Ville, to double what we're actually doing out in the community and in the world. And we got together, we figured out the ideas, and we kind of started crunching the numbers. And in order to fund that, we're going to have to do something crazy this, um, this December. We think in order to fund it, we need around a half million dollars this December. <laughs> oh, dear Heavenly Father. Uh, so I just, I'm just saying, that's like a 60, 70% increase on last year. And I don't know if we'll get it. And if we don't get it, we'll do what we get, right? From Praise God. He's, got, he's in control of it all. But I just want you to know that the lid to love the veil, we will not allow it to be will not allow it to be uh, ideas. The lid to love the bill will never be need because there's always need. The lid to love the bill will always be resources. And I think there's enough resources in the room to, to do this if we're willing to sacrifice in this way. Now, I would never ask you to give a, a half million dollars without explaining to you as clearly as I can where that money is going to. So real quick, in nine minutes, I want to fly through Everything that we want to do, or just about, a big chunk of what we want to do next year for Love the Ville. If we're going to pull off doubling our impact next year, we got to do three things, all right? Leadership's so hard, right? Here, here's what we got to do. We got to keep doing the good stuff we've been doing in the Ville, y'all. We got to add good stuff we should have been doing all along, and we feel like we need to revive our international outreach. First, let's start with the good stuff we've been doing. As you guys know, Love the Ville covers a vast array of things. About 20% of it is invested in partnerships that are impacting demographics in need all over our city. We impact the homeless. We impact single moms. We impact recovering addicts. I mean, all sorts of people. But our bread and butter for the last three years in Love the Ville, uh, about 80% of what we do is in our local school partnerships. We have seven local partners right now. And, uh, okay, so Chansey Elementary, Breckenridge Franken Elementary, LaGrange Elementary, Zachary Taylor Elementary, Norton Commons Elementary is the newest one, Oldham County Preschool and the Westport Tap School that you heard Melinda talk about earlier. Those are our seven. Now, if you're wondering what it looks like to, uh, to, be, a partner, uh, to be a partner school with us as a church, basically what we do is we go in when we're going to partner with somebody and we ask them two questions. And then we re-up and ask the same, or we, we do two things for them. One question one action. And we re-up on it every single year. First, we go in and we ask them, how can we help? And then we help. Following Jesus is so hard, guys. Okay, we go in. We ask the leaders, what can we do to help you give the next generation every opportunity to unleash their full potential on the world? And then whatever these leaders say next, as long as it's not evil or dumb, and it's it's never either, we do it. We help them do it. So like, here's what we did this past year. 
for our partner schools. We held five family-friendly parties, and family-friendly is important, right? We want to strengthen family units when we invest in this school. So all of them are things like daddy-daughter dance or family fall festivals. Uh, we held uh, one graduation event for the Westport Tap School, two back-to-school events, two Christmas parties that are coming up here in a couple weeks for around 400 students who uh, aren't, uh, aren't going to have Christmas otherwise. We did one massive blitz in August where we mobilized over 2,000 people to serve over 30 different public schools. Uh, we've done too many leader appreciation events for the teachers and principals there to count. We upfitted a lo the Love the Ville Reading Mobile, which is really a sweet story that I don't have time for. And um, every single week, we have countless mentors and countless volunteers in our schools serving on the ground with some of the most at-risk students in classrooms assisting teachers. It's Again, it's really amazing. And because of all this, we are now making as a church a measurable impact on the public school systems in our city. But I don't want to just make a measurable impact. I want to make an undeniable one because Jesus is undeniable. So next year we're going to do this again, all of it. And we're going to add two more schools to our partner list. Yeah. Now, you clap, you clap. But the only way that happens is with the sweat equity of the people of this church and the volunteer funding of the people of this church. So I just want to challenge you. This is where it goes. Now, second, we want to add some new initiatives that we feel like we should have been doing all along. My philosophy is this. Jesus calls us especially to two categories of people in the Gospels. Uh, one is kids, and the other is this category he calls the least of these in Matthew 25. And he says something interesting about both of them. He says, when you do unto them, you're actually doing unto me. It's like a one-to-one -one correlation. When you welcome a child, you're welcoming me. When you feed the hungry, clothe the naked, uh, go and care for the sick, or visit the prisoner, you're actually doing that for me. Jesus says this. So we want to do it. Now, if I were to grade us out on these two, we're kicking, I mean, we're just kicking butt with kids. We're doing so well. Praise God for that. But we don't have nearly as much energy or enthusiasm right now as, as we do for kids with the least of these. So, hey, you know, let's not beat ourselves up about it. Let's just do something about it. So here's what we want to do about it next year. Uh, we want to hire one and a half staffers to own it all, like our Matthew 25 ministries, if you will. And by the end of 2018, we want to have a thriving homeless ministry, a thriving prison ministry. We want to continue to improve our NECC pastoral care. We want to invest, and this is a pet peeve for me, $35,000 in pastors, 25 k in the next gen of pastors, raising them up and implanting a love the Ville spirit inside of them, and $10,000 into pastors who are in smaller churches in Kentucky that can't afford to have health care, can't afford to have a vacation, right? We want to tell them what you do is important, man. Go take a deep breath. Uh, want to develop a disaster relief fund. And you guys are great at this. I mean, you guys remember this last year, you know, what happened in Texas with Florida, Puerto Rico. You guys stepped up and we raised $25,000 in a month, just like that, right? But we just rather have that money waiting so we can be on the front lines, the first people there to show up with the love of Jesus. And, uh, and lastly, we want to support at least four refugee families next year. Now, let me talk about those refugee families real quick. Um, so uh, because of the current refugee, uh, uh, the refugee laws, the four refugee families that we will sponsor next year are what, uh, what are called SIV, SIV cases, special immigration visas, um, which basically means that the four families that we'll get will be either from Iraq or Afghanistan, and they will be families who have aided our troops over there. So they've either authored, uh, offered intelligence uh, in some way or translated for them, and so it's no longer safe for them to be in their country. So they get pushed to the front of the list. They'll get um, uh, placed here in Louisville, and we get an opportunity to give them a new life. Right? I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome. Now, um, speaking of that, let me jump to our third um, initiative for next year. We want to revive our international outreach. Basically, the last three years, we've been so focused on the Ville that, again, we've lost some of the energy and enthusiasm that we should have for the nations. Jesus calls us to all nations, right? So we want to revive that next year. We want to get more involved helping the people out from all over the world, not just our, our city. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. Hire Stafford to own it. Again, we're supporting these four refugee families. We're going to partner with uh, Norton Healthcare and take a bunch of their uh, unused medical supplies and uh, ship them overseas to Africa. And eventually, we hope that that will help uh, or allow us to introduce a medical global partnership in Africa. Because we got a lot of medical professionals in our community here. And we think you should be using your gifts, right? Uh, we're going to open the Jasper House in Haiti for another year, which is an uh, organization in Haiti that pulls women out of situations of sexual abuse or prostitution. It heals them spiritually, heals them physically, educates them, and then unleashes them on the world to, to lead. We're going to provide AIDS and HIV treatment to hundreds. We're going to build at least four new wells, and we're going to increase our funding to international college ministries by 50%. And again, yeah, I mean, praise God. But that's, that's just like, like, that's not even all of what we're going to get done. It's not even all, but it's a lot. So back to our statement, because I'm running out of time, back to our statement. If we're going to pull this off, 
We need 100%, 100% of our people to step up and give above, beyond, sacrificial gift. Above and beyond means above and beyond, right? Like the temptation would be to, to take your general fund giving, like your regular giving, and move it to the Christmas Eve fund. I'm asking you not to do that. I'm asking you not to rob Peter to pay Paul because that will handicap some of our other ministries that are so important next year, our children's ministry, our small groups ministry, ministries like that. And I'm also asking 100% of you to do it. People in the room, people online, you too. Like I know people, we got people that join us online from Minnesota every week, from New York every week, from Oregon every week. Look, if you benefit from this church's ministry, I'm asking you now to invest in our church's ministry. Okay, here's the good news. I'm not asking you to give 100%, even though that's what Jesus did. I'm, ask, I'm just asking for 100% of you to give. That's fair, right? Right? Now, we've crunched the numbers this week, and we figured out that if we have 3,000 giving units, then we'll need everybody to give about $167, and we'll get there, right? <laughs> Which is a lot of money. So to, to take the pressure off of some of us in this room who, who might not be able to afford this, I continued to crunch the numbers this week. And um, for those of you who may be a little bit more financially well off, I came up with this. It's, it's crazy. If one person... <laughs> If one person gives $500,000, then the rest of us don't even have to worry about it. And I can shut up about it until next December. So you never know who's in the room. Now, uh, here's, the, here's the easiest ways to give. You can get online, necchurch.org backslash give. We'll have a lobby kiosk out there for the next month after church you can go to. People will be holding buckets at the doors today. Um, you can bring a check to church. You can snail mail it to us. Just make sure you designate it to the Christmas Eve fund so it gets to the right place. And I promise you 100% of that will go to Love the Bill. All right, well, will you do me a favor? Will you stand with me? And uh, today, I want to close in a way that's a little bit crazy, a little bit different. We're not going to say our Jesus Creed or anything like that. I'm just going to pray a uh, crazy prayer of benediction over you. And the reason why I want to close with crazy is because 2,000 years ago, Christmas started with crazy, right? Crazy generosity. Jesus didn't give some. He gave all to us. He emptied his bank account so that ours might be full. He became our sin so we, we might know the righteousness of God. Okay, we believe in a virgin birth. We believe that God put on a bod and died for us and rose from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, that's crazy. And the only way to respond to crazy is with crazy. All right? So here's a crazy prayer over you. Dear God, make us better at being rich. <laughs> on your mark. Get set. In Jesus' name, we pray and go. Amen. Thank you, guys. So appreciative for you. Have a good week.